Michael, welcome to Tata Tata. Thank you very much. Tell us briefly what you do. Uh, I'm now a professor in comparative employment relations. And my background... <coughs> what, well, comparative employment relations? Yes. What does that mean? Well, um, my background is really in sociology. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time I studied industrial relations. But over the years, as you all know, industrial relations has become a much more kind of ghettoized subject. I think the term is now generally used is employment relations. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. <coughs> and the point being that, um, uh, obviously, with the rise of the service sector, uh, which is not actually industry, you can still have employment relations, you still have employer and employee, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore there are issues of power control that will continue, even though you're not actually specifically talking about industry. Okay. Now, comparative, uh, for me, uh, well, I think most people would probably mean um, between countries. Yes. So, for example, the institutional comparison between, for example, countries in Europe. And I do mean it like that, but I also have a broad sense of comparative in my own mind, which is also historical. I'm very interested mm -hmm. in the, uh, the history of, particularly contemporary history of industrial relations in Britain, comparing what's happening in the 1970s, for example, the way the crisis then was being reacted to as it is in relation to it, the way it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but also, in terms of um, the self-employed and the employed, um, the thing here is that uh, there's been an increasing number of self-employed people in Britain uh, and across the industrialised world generally, and they still confront issues of power of control at work. Now, not necessarily with the employer, but in relation to clients, Ooh. the way they control their time, the way they control where they work, how they work, work methods, these sorts of things, but also how they try to ensure they have a kind of steady income by controlling the flow of work and Okay. Relationship. So, uh, for me, comparative, the notion of comparative is very, very broad. Yeah. Now, I should explain that you, you have a certain interest in translators. Yes. How has that come about? Well, my back, you have to go back into the dim reaches of history. Mm -hmm. uh, my A-levels were in French, German, Spanish, English. I did language A-levels. But I didn't want to study language at university. So I did philosophy, politics and economics. But I maintained my interest in languages throughout that time. And I did my, my uh, doctorate in sociology. And at this point, in the 1970s, when I started, everybody was talking about industrial democracy. Mm -hmm. And we were looking to Germany and Sweden. You were um, all good Marxists in the uh, time, or not? Yes, yeah, it's a Gramsci, actually. <laughs> all right, yes. I was very interested in Gramsci and the prison notebooks. And good. my PhD actually uses a lot of Gramsci okay. to explain what's happening in the 1970s and the hegemony and these sorts of notions. Right. As you say, very uh, kind of. So you, you did the PhD where? At Edinburgh. In Edinburgh? Yeah, yes. that's right. Okay. Um, so my interest in industrial democracy was drawing on a lot of German, Swedish, Danish literature at that time, and so I maintained my interest in languages. And then when I was beginning to think about what to do, uh, at this point, early 1980s, jobs market was very, very tight, and I couldn't get an academic job at all. Um, I had a part-time job at Ruskin College, and I then went to work for a couple of publishing companies, one was called Income Data Services, and the other was called Industrial Relations Services. And what they did was to publish industrial relations journals, uh, looking at pay and benefits, uh, health and safety, employment law, these sorts of issues. And at both those companies, in turn, I edited the European Industrial Relations Journal. So for about eight, nine years, I wasn't academic, I was working as, mm -hmm. a, a, as a journalist, covering on a regular basis uh, what was going on in Europe, mm -hmm. um, in industrial relations. And of course, at this point, um, Britain had joined the European Union in 1973, and there was a lot of interest in the late 70s, early 1980s in the role of the European Union mm. and its impact on the UK in terms of employment relations. So that was my main speciality. So you see there again the comparison. You were using languages then? Absolutely, yes, because okay. every day I was coming to the office with a small team of you know, my, my colleagues. I mean, we were reading the European press. We had mm. absolutely, between us, we covered, I think, all the languages in the European Union, mm. apart from Finnish and Greek. Mm. We, we had a very wide range of, of uh, reading language. So we were using the source material to monitor what was going on, which we would then check. For example, supposing there was something interesting going on in Spain, perhaps a, a strike or a unionisation of a new sector or something like this. We would see that being referred to in the Spanish press, and then I was dealing with Spain at that point, 
either then ring up the CCLO or the UGT or the employers to find out what's going on and I would interview them on the phone and on the basis of that we would create our news stories and we would then publish them but having gone back to the source so that an English speaker would know what was going on in Spain. We did that for all the countries and uh, we had a very wide reach, you know, mainly amongst personnel, directors, human resource managers, trade unions, academics. I mean, made a very good living out of that for quite a long time, actually. Yeah. Mm. So how did you get into academic life? Well, the thing was that there were very flat structures in these publishing companies. And I was editor of the European Industrial Journal of the um, uh, IRS. And I realised by the late 80s I could carry on doing the same thing forever. I, you know, in mm. 20, 30 yeah. years' time, I could still be doing the same thing. And there wasn't any chance of getting onto the board. They were very small family-run companies. And I thought, did I really want to be writing a monthly journal in 10 years, 20 years? I, it, the other thing is, I, uh, my wife, Janet Fraser, who I Right, know, that's the secret well, connection. Jan is yeah. a translator. Right. She's a trained translator. Mm. She's a member of the ITI. I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered English. Mm -hmm. The Chartered English. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an amateur. Oh, okay. um, but Jan is a, a real translator. And she's professionally qualified. She's been on the tags and all this bodies and so on. And she's professionally very well networked. And um, um, about 10 years ago, uh, she got a little more interested in the issue of career, the careers of translators, and also entry into the profession. Mm. And we did a couple of articles together on translators, which actually, as it happens, interested me too. One, because I'm interested in languages and translating, but also because it, it, it raised issues of power, control, the things I was interested in anyway, mm. as a sociologist. Yes. So her professional networks and my academic kind of credentials, such as they were, came together rather neatly right. into these articles where we looked at translators and that's what it was. Mm. That's what it's about yeah. how they were dealing with recession. Because obviously, you know, 19, uh, 2005, yes. uh, 2008, we got this big recession. How are they dealing with recession? And uh, to cut the long story short, the results were really, very interesting because they showed a clear age divide between older translators who tend to see themselves as professionals mm. and weren't that concerned about, for example, expanding their business, and a younger uh, translator who was much more entrepreneurially minded and who actually called themselves entrepreneurs mm -hmm. rather than professionals. We asked them in our questionnaire whether they saw themselves more as entrepreneurs and we gave them various different types of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. or as professionals. And it was marked how the older ones saw themselves as professionals, whatever that means. Yeah. In other words, what, it, what I think the real point was that there wasn't a kind of objective answer as to how translators were doing in the obsession. It depended mm. very much on their subjective perceptions of the kind of role they were playing. With but the on, on age? It, it, yes, it does seem to be based on age. Now, we're only halfway through this research, and we are going to go back and do some interviews, because I think there may be some issues there we need to explore further. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was an interesting result, actually. And I think possibly there is a... Well, I mean, we talked so much about Thatcher's children, you know, those people, young people who were born in the 80s, mm. brought up in a very different world from what I remember, mm -hmm. uh, and who were brought up with more entrepreneurial values and sort of this sort of thing. And I think there has been a genuine shift towards more individualistic values mm. within, well, actually, society as a whole. I think you can see it across a wide variety of dimensions, but in particular at the micro level, in terms of this particular profession, this particular, you know, the translators, it seems to come through there too. Um, or would it have something to do with electronic communication, it with the possibility be. of being more independent? It, well, that, that could be. Except yeah. the older ones are also dependent on electronic communication. Yes. Yes. I mean, they're also all communicating with their clients through emails and all the rest of it. So, I mean, that, that may be an aspect, certainly. As, as a sociologist, if, if you pick up the research that's done in what's called translation studies, mm. do you have any general idea or opinion about that, about what we are doing? It's difficult to say because I'm not really up to speed on translation theory as a kind of whole. So it's or or to... just research when, when people who study translation try to do the sociology of translators. Yes. What does that look like? <laughs> what does it look like? I think it depends where they're coming from. Yes. Like, there's an analogy here, actually, with industrial relations. I mean, my core discipline I came from was industrial relations. Yep. Yes. Which um, itself is very multidisciplinary. Yes. It draws on economics, even on political science, sociology, history, all these things. And what you tend to find out is that different parts of that discipline, if it is a discipline, mm. sort of talk past one another. 
Because that's the, the, what we're having. I mean, the, the economists will, for example, talk about how terrible trade unions are because they are an impediment to the free you know, uh, operation of the markets. Mm. Whereas the sociologists, looking at the same institution, the trade unions, will say how important they are. That's yes. the way of redistributing income and so on. So you'll tend to get each side kind of talking past each other. I'm used to that in industrial okay. relations. And in some ways, it makes it just be quite vibrant because you get these different perspectives on the same thing. If you're a sociologist and you get interested in translators, then you do have the sociological theory, which you can draw on, which you then apply to the whole you know, paraphernalia of translation. If, on the other hand, you are a translator and you study sociology only those little bits that you really need, Yes. in order to help you. You're still a bit of an amateur when it comes to sociology. Yes. Now, I don't want to be elitist about this. I'm not saying this. No, that's, we, we, you're, we, getting, you're seeing this. the problem I'm worried about. Well, yes, exactly, because you know, we're, we're all doing this all the time. We have little tidbits of information that we know. This doesn't make us into scientists or economists, even though we may actually know quite a lot about economics and science, you know what I mean? Oh. But it's rather easy nowadays, particularly when we have wide access to everything we can think of, to kind of mine or extract what we need for our individual purposes and thereby we overlook the complexities yes. of the origins of those subjects and those theorists and I think that is an issue and, but like I say I'm used to that because in industrial relations we've been doing this for years and years and years and we're all used to it. it doesn't count. Now in the case of translation theory right, you are coming from a very wide variety of, well you said you're sort of multidisciplinary. Mm. Um, I think that the worry for me might be if you were um, a linguist or you're a French or a German specialist and you become a, a translator and then if you apply little bits of sociology or little bits of economics or little mm. bits of labour market theory to explain things without really understanding the complexity of the whole yeah. so it means a, so, a real a real quote sociologist or a real quote economist could come in and actually be quite critical are the way you have selectively used bits of theory without taking into account the, 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 the totality. That would be my worry. Yes. However, you don't have that if you have a sociologist who's studying translation theory. You see what I mean? Yes. Somebody who's actually very well versed in sociology, yes. I mean, have studied it to a degree level or whatever. You know. But I, I don't know how else you get around that because um, unlike some areas, uh, translation theory is, I think, of its nature very multidisciplinary. Isn't it? I mean, I mean, what? How do you understand translation theory? I mean, to me, it could mean anything from um, uh, from, from a linguistic analysis of how translators actually tackle a text and how they go about translating particular texts for different audiences. I mean, it could be that level, or you could be looking at translators' careers, mm. or you could be looking at the history of translation again, like Christie was doing with her Buddhist texts in her in her in her PhD. I mean, all those different ways of looking at the linguistics, the sociology, the history, they're all part of translation theory, aren't they? I think it'd be all... Am I not right? You can't be wrong. Um, have you got any suggestions of research topics? Uh, if, if you were picking up a, a student in sociology, for example, who wanted to do something with translation, yes. what would you recommend? Are there any particular topics or aspects that, that you would think would be of interest, of particular interest? Well, actually, yes, I, I think, um, I mean, again, I can only speak personally. I am very interested in how people enter labour markets, <clears throat> how they maintain their status within labour markets. I'm also interested in freedom's work. We do have at the moment, I mean, having grown up with the, the Iron Curtain and the Cultural Revolution in China, um, I'm still amazed that really what we don't know about mm. China Yes. It's about the emerging nations. And it's changing so fast. It's changing it's very, very fast indeed. And I think to do something on, um, for example, career structures within China, yes. I think would be very, very valuable. Yeah. Because given the huge size of that particular country and where it's going to dominate the global economy for you know, the coming years, I think the more we find out about China and how it actually manages to... Um, sustain a career like uh, uh, translation, I think it's really very important. Yes. I mean, we know probably quite a lot about Europe. We don't know very little about China or India, for example. Yes. So I think there's a lot to do there in, 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 in